tales for dark nights. The following program is a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com to learn more about this and our other weekly storytelling programs and become a patron today to show your support and get instant access to our extensive archive of downloadable ad-free tales of terror. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. The following program is intended for mature audiences and may contain strong language, adult themes, and content of a violent and sexual nature which may not be appropriate for everyone. Welcome, listener, to the Horror Hill. If it's the darkness you seek, you won't be disappointed. I'm your host, Jason Hill, and it's time for our appointment. In this place, there is no sun, and nightmares do come true. Here, instead of shadow falling, the shadows follow. Consider getting comfortable before the air grows colder. Prepare yourself if you dare. Come, inch a little closer. If darkness is what you're after, seek no more your searches through. You haven't found the darkness, traveler. The darkness has found you. Back for another visit, are we? And they all said being a vampire would be... Sexy. Certainly a step south in terms of hygiene, but... It is gluten-free. At least. Please forgive my nocturnal indignations, but it's certainly been a week here at the Horror Hill, with many unforeseen lifestyle adjustments. Or... Death-style adjustments, I suppose. On death, as you may have surmised from my boneyard bitching, is a dirty business. And nothing quite hammers that wooden stake home better than tonight's offering. Something that we hope we've wet your appetite for. A ghastly grindhouse tale so grim and gritty that we had to chop it up into multiple installments for your consumption. So, for those with a taste for blood, from author Drew Stepek, I give you chapters one through chapters five of Knuckle Supper. Chapter 1 Merchants Every once in a while, things went horribly wrong. Des, get her in the fucking bathroom, you asshole! I screamed subduing the pimp by wrapping him across the neck with a crowbar. He dropped. Snot from his jug head splashed all over the hardwood floor. The dogs went into a frenzy in the backyard. And tell the dogs to shut up, I added. Des ran his fingers through his hair, trying to get it out of his face. I always wished he'd cut that shit hair of his. While licking gel off his index finger, he whispered, What the hell, bro? The pimp squirmed around. He was still alive. Our little blood theater wasn't a wrap. Not yet. He struggled to his feet and made a run for the door, but I tripped him by chucking the crowbar at his legs. It was enough to send him nosediving back to the floor. Unfortunately, I only managed to bone out one of his legs. I looked at Dez. He was restraining the little girl. She wasn't shaking. I think she was just shocked. 
She probably figured we were going to rape her. Just get her in the bathroom, dumbass. She's fucking 12. Des shot me a salute, opened the bathroom door and shoved the girl inside. He bolted it from the outside. You can be a real pussy sometimes, RJ, he said. You'd think that more junkies would find it strange that our bathroom had not one, but three deadbolts that locked from the outside. Then again, I took some mean smashes. My diet didn't exactly consist of low-fat chicken breasts stir-fried lightly with organic veggies. That being said, I wouldn't envy anyone locked up with me in close quarters. Without acknowledging that once I got high, I was going to beat the shit out of Des for his stupidity, I proceeded to the pimp. While brushing the blood from his nose and out of his mouth, he crawled to our front door, trying to get the locks that prevented him from establishing contact with the outside world. The bathroom wasn't the only door with deadbolts. His yellow, chipped nails dug into the wood like he was holding on to the side of Mount Everest without a rope a carabiner, or a spotter. Trembling, he got halfway up the door. His compounded left leg dangled sideways, more hindrance at this point than a method of propping him up. He felt around the first lock and dropped a little bit. I ripped off a stainless steel security chain from around my neck. Looking for these? I unhooked the clasp on the homemade necklace and let it unravel to my waist, revealing three keys on the end. The pimp looked at me, stunned. It was one of those moments when someone realizes that they're fucked. Dez ran from the bathroom door and snatched the key and the chain out of my hand. The pimp cried as his head rested on the door. Oh, please, bro. Oh, don't kill me. I'm nobody. He slid down to where his ascension began, defeated. They were always defeated in the end. Dez walked over to him. You are nobody, bitch. And now you're gonna get me high for the rest of the night. I grabbed Des on the shoulder. Don't kill him, idiot. You know that's not what we want. He shrugged off my hand and proceeded toward the bitch beater who was crying against his last hope to escape. Wait, uh, wait, uh, wait, wait, wait a minute. The pimp whimpered. I, I, I know who you are. He braced himself up slightly by planting his palms onto the floor. What are you? BBP? Sangre? Battlesnakes? His words stumbled as he pleaded. I, 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 I can, I can help you. This continued his trek. Wrong, motherfucker. Do I look like a Beverly Hills shithead to you? Do I look like a Mexican? Am I a fucking Rasta? We're knucklers. He stood over the trapped rat and kicked at his almost emancipated leg. The pimp slid backwards on his mitts. Then, without even hesitating, my snaky friend began thumping the chain and keys down on his head, using them as a weapon. Stop, Des! In all reality, I didn't care if this piece of shit was mortally injured, but he had to be alive. We both knew that even a douche like this guy wasn't any good to us. Quiet. I nabbed Dez's wrist before the chain collided with the skull for the fifth time. Don't be a psycho. Do you want to get high or not? I ripped the chain out of his hand, tossing it into the dining room and added, I get first dibs. He flicked a blood droplet off his girly eyelashes. You always get first dibs. The pimp grabbed his leg and ran his tongue across his toothless gums. I walked back toward the coffee table, grabbed two loaded syringes, and wiped off all the asshole goop that had landed on them. Noticing for the first time that the vicious beating had pitched his gore over most of the room, I put one syringe in my front pocket. Hold him still. I looked at the bathroom door. Not a sound. Either the preteen girl behind it was scared, assuming she was next, or she didn't care whether or not we killed the asshole that drop kicked her down Sunset Boulevard on a nightly basis. Des got behind the pimp, secured him in a headlock, and extended his forearm toward me with a wrist held upright. Why 
did we go through all that? We should have just killed both of them at the same time. She's a junkie, RJ. Just hold him still, I commanded. You know there isn't another way to do this. You want to end up back on Skid Row eating rats? I bent down on one knee, inhaled the warmth of human, and grabbed the pimp about halfway up his forearm. Des freed up his arms from the headlock and popped both of the pimp's ears, causing the scumbag's head to waver around like a cartoon cat who took a frying pan to the face. Without wasting a beat, Des replaced his restraint with the legs by crossing them over the dude's torso, and then he looped his feet back around. With his hands now free, Des yelled for me to hand him the needle. I did as he asked. His hand was jittery as he accepted it. Don't fuck this up for me, dude, I insisted. Stay steady. Shit, you act like this is the first time something went wrong. Remember when that one homeless guy started squirting shit and piss all over the house? Who, me? He squealed, and he flippantly tapped on the cylinder and pushed the air out of the syringe. He tightened his leg lock, and the pimp's eyes rolled up, showing nothing but white. I was pretty sure the guy wasn't going anywhere, and we have superhuman strength and all that. I knew this was going to be more of a problem than it was worth. You and these fucking cattle. Like they give two jogs about you. He shuffled his hand with the syringe, emulating jerking off. Brown blood bubbled out of the pimp's mouth. He tried to chew on his lip, but he came up with nothing but gums and crust. The chain sprayed his teeth all over the carpet like we were playing 52 pickup in a dentist's office. My grip tightened on the forearm, and I felt his heartbeat and an orgasmic flush swept through my body. Whatever. I grabbed onto the pimp's middle finger, pushing the other fingers down and out of the way. Oh, you really need to get that hair out of your eyes, Des. I laughed and made a weepy emo face. Why? Are you a 15-year-old kid angry because his pussy hurts? <laughs> Des laughed a little and tapped at the needle again with the hand that was locked around the pimp's neck. Someday, you're going to thank me for always being here. You could never do this alone. I held up the pimp's middle finger. Fuck you. Get it done. One. Two. Now spike this asshole. Laughing, Des sunk the needle into the pimp's wrist. As soon as all the heroin was in his blood... I cranked the elbow quickly to the left and then to the right. Knowing the arm was loose by feeling the already brittle bone give, I commanded, Pull the plug! Without hesitation, Des pulled the spike from the wrist, and I tore the forearm from the pimp's body and held it vertically in the air. I quickly snapped off the fuck you finger directly at the knuckle. Then, I sucked and allowed the blood to flow into my mouth like some deranged beer bong. As I drank the sweet nectar, I scuttled across the floor, back to the coffee table. I searched around with one eye in my hand and grabbed a powdery new latex glove. I stretched out the glove with my hand and capped the end of the severed arm. Hurry up in there, RJ. This grit is going into shock and losing a lot of blood. If his heart stops, it's your ass. Both of Dez's arms were now taming the squirming body of the pimp. Knowing time was running out, I kicked over a glass bong and then inched the bong stand toward me with my right foot. Hurry! Des screamed. Finally, I spit the knuckle out of my mouth, placed the arm in the bong holder, and dragged my rapidly fading ass across the floor. Des released his legs and reversed his position quickly so he was facing his prey. He laid the body down on its back. I grabbed what remained of the already trashed arm cranked it toward the sternum, and rested it above his heart. Des dropped his weight into the pimp's chest. Trying to prevent more blood from coming out of the torn appendage, I wrapped a towel around the breakpoint, then massaged my leg across his chest, toward the still-attached arm, hoping to redirect the blood flow. Des hopped to the intact arm more sloppily than I had. He severed it at the forearm. 
I nabbed the needle from my front pocket, forced out the air, and tapped it as I tried to hold in the blood from the other arm. Keeping the dying pimp still, I took the needle and plunged it into a vein on the wrist. When the syringe was empty, Des cracked off the knuckle with his teeth. As he started sucking away, I moved toward the top of the armless pimp, hugged his neck like a strangler with the element of surprise, and with one turn to the right and one turn to the left, I removed his head from what still remained of his torso. The chest plate sucked in one last time and gassed out from his five open holes. He pissed and shit himself. Des managed to make it over to the coffee table to get his latex cap. I tossed the head aside and went back toward the bong display. That's a mess, Des joked. His eyes rolled back and forth from the heroin. I held up my arm bong for cheers. He just fell backward on a beanbag chair. Oh, fuck you then, I said, turning the arm up to my mouth. Call one of your little Desians to clean this up. Desians. That's what I called his pussy ass followers. The dope began flowing with the blood of the pimp through the dust inside of me. I felt nice, warm, comforting. My head nodded back and forth and bobbed from side to side. The feeling was so comforting because it was the only thing I ever knew how to feel. Heroin meant more to me than my body, my face, my words, and even my brain. Des and I are in a pack called the Knucklers. Yeah, I suppose we're vampires, but more importantly, we're junkies and gangster motherfuckers. Alright, RJ. Yeah. What are we going to do about the girl in the bathroom? Oh, yeah. That's a good question, Des. Usually after Des went to go fade for a few hours, I listened to music in my own days. I was a collector of old-school British and American vinyl 7-inch punk rock records. Something about the sound was so raw and so shittily recorded that it always put me in a really good vaporous state. It was kind of like being in a slow-motion scene in a movie where you faintly hear music but it sounds like a single speaker boombox being broadcast through a tin can. Adding to the majesty of my circulatory antifreeze, my dogs howled at the Los Angeles wind chimes outside. That's police sirens to you tourists out there. I worshipped the smell and taste of the heroin that summer night. The drug was always quite a bit more pleasant than the blood that I had to use to bulldoze it into my system. I always have some blood in my body, but it's more like a small reserve of canteen water being carefully monitored by someone lost in the desert. It depletes, and it doesn't come back. I spent hours, or probably more like minutes, sifting through my stacks upon stacks of records, spreading them out all over the floor, and looking at the artwork on the front that was more often than not a Xeroxed paper. The biggest pain in the ass was when I was in a state of fucked upness, was switching out the little yellow spindle adapters that go in the middle. I thought for a long time that I'd just buy a thousand of those things and just put them inside all of my records to make things a lot easier. For me, though, that took away time from killing people and doing drugs and shit. After all, I led the knucklers. I tried to be careful not to bust any of my 45s because they were collector's items. Sad thing is that I often flopped around on the floor like a fish that just landed on the deck of a fisherman's boat. As I sipped away on the pimp's arm, filled with that sweet garbage nectar, I dropped my knee onto a record and cracked it. It sounded like a bone breaking. Pissed off, I flung it across the living room into the kitchen. I didn't look at what it was. I hoped when I woke from my glaze that it wasn't one of the expensive ones. They were hard to replace because when they originally came out, the bands only printed about a hundred of them. It was always a great thing to be wasted, at least while it was going on. 
I sat on a cloud and convinced myself for the longest time that I remember everything in the morning. I rarely did, though. I looked in the direction of the record I shot like skeet. I went to see what it said on the label and whether or not the wax was fixable. Then, I tripped on my own feet, knocking my arm bong onto the records. God damn it, I yelled at myself. I picked up the bong and grabbed a Harrington jacket off the couch to dab away the mess. Thankfully, most of the records were in plastic sleeves, but the dust that collected on them was mixed with blood, urine, phlegm, and whatever else was in the pimp's dislodged arms and head that turned into this atrocious, gelatinous concoction that made me vomit. Barfing made things much worse. I tried to suck it back down my esophagus, but as soon as the barf retreated back toward my stomach, it snowballed and came back up, bigger, stronger, and far ranker. Stymied, I slumped my back against the entertainment center behind me and crossed my arms like a frustrated little baby, bumping the needle on the player across the entire record. Then, I scratched my forehead. I immediately realized that I was rubbing wretch combined with the pimp's special sauce all over my head and hair. I tilted my head sideways, let out a big oomph, and asked myself rather impolitely, what the fuck is wrong with you? Meaning me. Looking around the room filled with heroin needles, body parts, shit, piss, vomit, records, blood, and a stiff pimp, I answered my own question. Oh, yeah. Old RJ was never defeated, though. Like I told Des earlier, one of his little Desians should come over and clean the mess. So, I picked myself up, cautiously, and made my way past my bedroom and knocked on his door. Des? I asked. No response. Des? Can you call one of your little pussy shits to come over here and clean up my mess? I opened the door a crack. Dez was sprawled out on my guest bed, covered in blood and narcotics, hugging his chunk of the pimp like a whoopee. Hey, Dez! He rolled away from facing the door and let out a high-pitched wheeze. What the fuck do you want, RJ? His whiny voice stabbed my ears. I stayed out of the light in the hallway. I didn't want him to see what a mess I had made of myself. Pigpen for the Peanuts gang would have been ashamed to hang with me. I brought my negativity down a notch. So, Des, I was wondering... I began as I picked a chunk of puke off the side of my nose. If you can call your friends to come clean up? The house is a disaster. Des shot up in bed. Close the fucking door, you junkie. We'll have them clean it tomorrow. Fuck, dude, the heroin wasn't that good. He threw his portion of the pimp at the door. The severed arm slammed across my face, creating a wind pocket that blew my own stench directly up my nose. I put my hands up to my mouth, but it was too late. Spunk bombed through the alleys between my fingers and drooled down my arms to my elbows. Seemingly forgetting everything that had happened in the past hour, I quickly unbolted the bathroom door and took off my shirt. After throwing it in the shower, I headed toward the sink, cranked on the faucets, and began cupping water all over the upper half of my body. I swear that I saw stink lines and squiggles emanating from my head. It was pretty rare that I gave myself a full sink bath, but turning on the shower at that point seemed like more of a chore. If the sink is good enough for the French, then goddammit, it was good enough for me. After I was somewhat satisfied... I turned off the water flow and dragged my feet back to the living room. I figured I'd start cleaning. I blacked out instead. About an hour later, I woke up. I looked over to my right. All my records were stacked nicely. I take that back. They were stacked, sure, but in between each one, sludge dripped over the sides, making the mound look like a shit sandwich with all the fixings. That's funny... I said to myself. I don't remember doing that. I had never in fact ever stacked my records until the morning, because I always wound up in a situation like the bodily chaos I created earlier that night. 
I eyeballed the room to see if Des had called one of his Desians to come over and clean while I was passed out. No one was there. Mm. I knew Des didn't clean it up. Like a kid on a pogo stick, I suddenly bounced to my feet and ran down the hallway toward the bathroom. I tried to reassure myself that I had stacked the records, but it was pointless. Even that fucked up, I wouldn't have left the puke and sludge all over them. Sure enough, when I reached the shitter, all the bolts were unlocked. Still too wasted to use my brain enough to decide what I was going to do about the little whore in there, I swiftly and discreetly locked all the dead bolts. The last thing I wanted to do was explain to Des how she got out of the bathroom. On top of that, she had been in our living room, stacking my records, for some reason. Chapter 2 Delinquents While the rancid stench from our dance with the devil still encased the living room, I, on the other hand, smelled like Irish spring. After shaking off my buzz and having taken a proper shower in the master bathroom, I decided it was time to figure out what to do about the twelve-year-old whore in the community bathroom. Thankfully, Des was still in bed. Typical of him. In his defense, it was my fault that the girl wasn't dead yet. I knocked on the shitter door. Are you okay in there? No response. I unlocked the first bolt. I'm coming in. If you're thinking about ambushing me when I open the door, I wouldn't recommend it. Clink. I heard what I imagined was the towel bar dropping to the tile. I unlocked the second dead bulk and spoke calmly as I peered into the bathroom. Smart move. The brutal girl was standing on the edge of the tub with her toes curled over the porcelain edge like a gargoyle. Her body looked shaken, but her eyes told another story. The little human seemed indebted that we had offed the pimp and spared her life. I'm coming in, and I don't think I'm going to hurt you. I opened the door to its full extent and propped both my arms up against either side of the doorframe, blocking any escape. I know you're probably a little freaked out here. It's all kind of difficult to explain. She locked onto my eyes and boldly said, Not really. Pimps owe people money. She smirked as she brushed her greasy, skunk-streaked hair out of her young face. Her blistered bottom lip quivered slightly, and her picky nostrils flared. Open, closed, open, open, closed. Her squinty, blood-cracked eyes rolled around slowly, trying to hatch her escape route. So, are you gonna fuck me, or kill me? Or fuck me, then kill me? Or kill me, then fuck me? You sure didn't seem interested when you came in here earlier to watch all that shit in the sink. She started to pull down her ripped jean shorts. Oh, Jesus, keep your pants on, I said, dropping my guard to cover my eyes. As quickly as I covered my face, I was belted in the nuts with a stainless steel shower radio. Ow! I yelled, doubling over in pain. She booked past me and headed toward the front room. In an aggravated state, I attempted to appeal to any sense that this little whore might have. You can't get out, stupid. Reflecting, that probably wasn't the smartest thing to say. She ran back over to me and unleashed a barrage of blows to my neck and back with the radio as it dialed through three or four different Latino stations. No shit, asshole. After about ten blows, I caught the radio with my right hand and nabbed her wrist with my left. I could have snapped the thing off so easily. For some dumb reason, I didn't. Relax. I slid the radio across the room on the hardwood floor and grabbed her other wrist. Oh, man. Did I want to break both her arms backwards and crack them off and just 
beat the shit out of her. She felt my power. She tried to get me to release. Don't you fucking touch me, creep! She yelled. I nudged her with my eyes. There's your pimp. And then threw her down next to him. I know, fucked hard! She roared. I saw him earlier when I came out here to try to steal some of your heroin and see if I could sneak out. You were passed out with your hands in your pants, queer. Do you really want to end up like that? You aren't going anywhere until we figure this all out. She shoved herself away from the corpse. What do we need to figure out? Are you going to kill me or what? She backed herself into the corner. Her head twitched and she covered her face with her hair as she tried to avoid looking at the pimp. Who are you, psychos? I cracked my neck and fully stood up. Walking cautiously like a child trying to feed a deer, I moved in a little closer. I come in peace. I put up my arms to show her that I wasn't planning any shenanigans. Kind of. She shoved herself farther into the corner and her hardened eyes started to swell. What the fuck are you? I hesitated, unsure how to answer that question. Then, I blurted out, I'm a gangster. You don't look like a gangster. Her eyes focused on my chest. My eyes inched down to see what she was looking at. I already knew. On my chest was my ink, a Batman symbol. In my defense, it was actually the symbol of the skater Steve Caballero's band, The Faction. The thing was that I had the band's name written on the top of the black bat in dark blue ink. In other words, you couldn't really see it. I grabbed for a t-shirt thrown on the back of a chair and casually pulled it over my head. What do you know about the gangs in Hollywood anyway? You're like, 12? She smirked. Obviously she knew I was embarrassed by the dumb tattoo. Gee, I don't know. I've been on the streets turned out for over a year now. I didn't understand how she was staying so relatively calm with the shredded corpse on the floor about six feet away from her. Or why she didn't try to kill me when she stacked the crud records. Your name's RJ, right? I heard your lovers quarrel with your friend earlier. Lovers quarrel. What does that mean? Stunned by her ease in my slaughterhouse, I finally asked. Why aren't you freaking out at all? You just killed my pimp. Now answer the question, Batman. What are you? I scratched the tattoo through my shirt... I guess you could call me a vampire. You're kind of out of shape for a vampire, she chortled. She wasn't wrong. I stood just under six feet and had fried hair that I'd call a rat's nest if it wasn't an insult to vermin everywhere. I didn't have a lot of body tone because most of my flesh seemed bloated from narcotics and alcohol. I had a big lower lip and an even bigger nose. I tried to brush the tobacco off my teeth as much as possible, but since they were contained inside a walking carcass, they never really shined like chompers on a toothpaste commercial. I had nice eyes though, so that could be considered a double helping of cherries on top of a turd. At least that's what I looked like the last time I stood face to face with my own reflection. Contrary to popular belief, we have always been able to see our reflections. No matter. I didn't like looking at myself. The only thing I ever saw was a serial killer looking back at me, laughing at me for somehow being able to live. Finally, I said, Thanks. I know I'm out of shape. Thud, thud, thud. I looked at the front door and then at the little skunk girl. Thud, thud, thud. Shit. I grabbed her by the back of her striped halter top and rushed her back to the bathroom and threw her in. I put my index finger to my mouth. Shh. I whispered. Down the hall, I heard Dez fumbling his way out of bed. I snapped the outer bathroom locks in place and ran to his door to greet him as he opened it. Hey, I said with a smile. Thud, thud, thud. Dez looked up at me and squinted. What the fuck is wrong with you? Answer the damn door, RJ. I improvised. I came by to get you first. Is someone supposed to come by here? 
He squinted at me a second time. No. He shoved me aside and headed toward the front door as I cut my eye on the bathroom. Aloof, I followed him down the hall. He put his face against the door. I got into a grappling position, as if I was about to enter a wrestling ring. Dez looked over at me. Hey, retard, what in the hell is wrong with you? I looked at myself in the mirror next to the door. I did look like an idiot. Um, I did some blow. How? I kicked what was left of the pimp on the floor in the ribs. I'd just mix it in with the blood from this asshole. That was a waste. He repressured his head against the door. Who is it? He asked. It's Limwood Perry, the voice on the other side returned. What do you want? A copper told me to come over. I need something taken care of. The illustrious Linwood Perry was the leader of a vampire gang who ran the Beverly Hills and Bel Air area. The BBPs, or the Blue-Blooded Perrys. They were a bunch of wannabe rich kids who loved coke and all dressed similarly in Fred Perry tennis sweaters, stack haircuts, and white leather tennis shoes. All of them had the last name Perry, Linwood Perry, Greg Perry, Lance Perry, etc. We thought it was pretty lame, but truth be told, they were a ruthless bunch. The name and look came from a gang of soccer hooligans in England called the Perry Boys. The originators were these poor kids from the streets that stole clothing and put out this vibe that they were these normal, preppy kids. And then they just kicked the shit out of people. Linwood surveyed the room. Huh. Looks like some partying went on here tonight. Wow, look at that loser. He wandered over to the pimp. Damn. Oh, you knuckler sure are dirtbags. <sighs> so, what's the deal, Lin? I asked as I yawned, dipped a cigarette in the pimp's eye socket, and lit it. For some reason, the blood from the eye mixed with the cigarette and fire was tastier than just dipping it in blood. If Perry wasn't a vampire like Des and me, I guess he might have found it intimidating. We have a snitch. Perry produced a pack of Dunhills from the pocket of his button-down that was nicely pressed under his v-neck sweater. Covering his nose with a monogrammed hanky, he bent down to the pimp, pressed the filter end of the cigarette into one of the missing tooth graters in the mouth, and then lit it with a zippo by torching the roof of the pimp's mouth. I'm not going to lie... It was pretty cool. Des wasn't so impressed. Yeah? And? Well, since the Knucklers have become the Battlesnakes whipping bitches since the, um, how do I say this? Incident. He looked at Des and then back at me. We all feel it would be better if you took care of the problem. I arched my back to tower over Linwood. Who exactly is we? With his cigarette dripping between his index finger and his middle finger like a pretentious asshole, he took a drag. Me? Copperhead. That's who we is. I popped my thumb in and out of my mouth. Copperhead. Copperhead. He has no say over what we do in our area. Des moved a little closer to me. RJ, he kind of does now. King Cobra doesn't bother with this low-level shit anymore. I flashed Des a shit look. He was friends with Copperhead, and I didn't trust any of those Rasta fucks. I looked back toward Perry. So, if that's the case, what's the story? Is this guy a Perry? Yes. Apparently, Gavin. I looked back at Des and giggled a little, made a limp-wristed gesture, and mouthed the name Gavin. Des turned away from me to hide his face. He was laughing. Real funny, RJ, Linwood said, shoving me. How about I just leave now and let you deal with the snakes? I wiped my smirk clean. Okay, okay, dude, just, just relax. Anyway... This asshole has been blabbing to these two slices of bacon for a boatload of coke. 
It's all confiscated from high-level busts. He's giving the pigs maps of the city and where all of us run things, and also giving them locations of exact compounds. Since the guy's a pussy and he would rather have the coke and the cadavers handed to him by the cops than deal with our way of doing things. I smacked myself on the side of the head. Are you fucking kidding me? Lynn, you gotta control your boys. What's in it for the cops anyway? Did your rat tell them that they could be turned? Harry nodded his head. I guess. That is, unless the LAPD is planning some kind of bust. I sincerely doubt that, though. My mouth dropped. When were people going to realize that isn't the way all this vampire shit worked? Okay, Lynn. What I don't get is why we have to take care of this problem. Simple. The snakes don't want to get everyone all freaked out over the cops knowing everything about the territories and the gangs. That being said, Gavin meets with these cops in your area so they don't get busted by us. In all honesty, your territory, your problem. I looked at Des again and shrugged my shoulders. Well, I suppose that makes sense. Killing another idiot is killing another idiot. Where and when? Is there anything we should know about this Gavin? Des giggled. I mean, is there anything special about him? Not very big. Typical BBP. He's meeting these guys in an hour behind the Samsung building on Wilshire. Do you know where that is? It's only the biggest fucking building in the area with a huge neon blue sign on top. Consider it done, I assured Linwood. But let's make things clear. You go tell Copperhead that this isn't going to be a regular thing. This is your mess, Lin. I swept my hand down the shoulder of his white cable knit sweater. I've always been curious. Where do you guys buy all these expensive threads anyway? Linwood plucked my hand off his arm and dropped it back to my side, as if he was discarding a plastic bag full of dog shit. Posers on Melrose, idiot. He shoved me on the chest. You should shop there. Who farted? He said, reading my bleached t-shirt out loud. Classy. You should really learn how to do your laundry. Rather than furthering our runway model fashion fight, I tapped Des on the back. Des, see him out of here and around the block. And then I flicked Linwood on the chin. You are just so lucky that a random knuckler didn't pop you for being over here. As soon as I shuffled them out, I headed back to the bathroom, unlocked all the deadbolts, and grabbed the whore from her new stoop atop the toilet. Shh. I reminded her. Throwing her over my shoulder, I rushed her down the hall and into my bedroom. I quickly opened my closet and threw her in there. I nabbed a pair of handcuffs that were for some reason, hanging from a belt loop on an old pair of jeans, cuffed her hands, and then locked her around a hanger bar. Frumpily, she dropped flat-footed and broke the hanger bar in the center. My clothes dumped off the bar and all over her. Stay quiet or you're dead. I got nowhere to go, she said, falling into the mound of shit she dumped everywhere. I can't tell you to this day why I didn't throw her out the window to deal with my dogs in the backyard. Regretfully, I just didn't. This is lame. Why didn't you tell me the Battlesnakes were going to start using us for this vice principal bullshit, Des? Let's not get into this, RJ. You know why. I left it at that. I did know why we owed them. I just like to try to forget the fact that I was indebted to the most dangerous thugs in Los Angeles. They were the faux Rasta drug-running leaders of the vampy underworld. Regrettably, I had to bow down to a bunch of dingbats who couldn't have come up with a better name than the... Ugh, battle snakes. We both sat on a fire escape on the side of the building overlooking the alley where Linwood told us the snitch was going to be waiting for his pig buddies. 
Des and I dangled our legs over the railing, trying to be quiet. Along with super strength, vampires have an acute sense of hearing, so we didn't want to set off any alarms for this Gavin Perry to know that his jig was up. I pointed to a billboard across the street, a vampire film called The Chronicles of Nightshade, Our Darkness. Your boy, I said to Des. On the advertisement was Hollywood's latest vampire pinup tool, holding hands with a teenage girl. A red moon separated them. He was flexing his muscles toward the shadow of a werewolf that appeared to supernaturally cradle the girl. I prefer the books, he admitted. I cocked my head toward him. Really? You prefer the books? So you're admitting you've read them? He lashed back, becoming uppity. Hasn't everyone? Um, no. God, RJ, leave me alone. So I read some vampire books. I put my arm around Des. It was better to leave him alone sometimes than to constantly bag on him for his idiotic pastimes and behavior. This was not one of those times. Hello, Gavin. Would you like to take down your knickers and let me give you a cock a good flogging? He shoved me away, laughing. Get off! In all honesty, I always gave Des a lot of shit. He tried to put out this aura that he was this chosen god among living dead people. But he was just another street schmuck, trying to swindle the next sucker waiting in line to be killed. I guess if I were to call someone my little brother, it would be him. Hard to say who is older, though, I suppose. None of us really knew our ages. I did guess that I was about 30-something, and he was about 20-something, but there was never any real way to tell. We simply couldn't remember where we came from or who we were. I know that I was found in the street, eating rats by an older member of the current Knucklers named Pico. I didn't know much beyond that, though. And that's where I found Daz, too. Vermin feasting on the urine-flooded streets of a dead city. Dude, quiet. Des whispered as he pointed below. Two cops pulled up about a block away and walked down the alley. One of them was carrying a duffel bag. It wasn't like a gym bag, it was one of those bags you see the SWAT team unloading after a huge bust. Bingo, I said. Using a front bar of the rusted fire escape, Des and I slowly pulled ourselves up. When he was halfway, I kicked out his left foot. In a wimpy voice, I mocked him. I prefer books. Let it go, RJ, he said as he grabbed onto the rail of the jiggling fire escape. As predicted, a tennis sweater wearing BBP sashayed from the other end of the alley toward the cops. Des and I crept down a flight of stairs in an attempt to get our super ears within reach of the conversation. Gavin went over and fist bumped the cops. Sup, Roger? Sup, Picky? Not much, Gavin. What you got for us? I nudged Des and went limp-wristed like I had before, mouthing the name Gavin in a negatively fruity way. Something big is about to go down, Gavin returned. He was being honest. My ears smelled sincerity. Even a rat tells the truth sometimes. One of the cops rolled back his sleeve and cut through a vein in his wrist almost up to his elbow. Want a taste? He took out a little baggie from his pocket and handed it to Gavin. Hmm. Huh. Where did this shit come from anyway? Gavin asked as he lifted the arm up, smeared the blood around a little, and then shook some powder into the open wound. The numbing cut to the wrist, combined with the pain, made the cop shiver and shake like a wet hound. I figured the whole production was Gavin's way of convincing the nitwit detectives that they could be turned. Gavin ran his nose directly up the arm and swiftly brushed his head up at the end of the line. He stood upright for a second. The arm remained steady like a table. He closed his eyes, put his fingers up to both sides of his nose, and snorted all the blood and drugs in like a vacuum. Gavin's etiquette was sloppy at best. Then again, I never really got into snorting myself. I preferred the instantaneous rush of mainlining. 
He shook off the split-second satisfaction and his eyes bulged down. Oh, goddamn, boys. That isn't coke. No, it is not. One of the officers returned. Oh, me likey, boys. Perry continued as he pushed the mystery powder into his brain with his index and middle fingers. Like I was saying, some big shit is gonna happen. Like what? One of the cops asked, holding back the duffel bag. I rolled my eyes. Even a shit like Gavin could have just swiped the thing from them and torn them to pieces. Dez whispered in my ear, Hey, let's go now, get this over with. Shut the fuck up, Dez. I want to hear this. Come on, dude. I held Dez back by grabbing his devil lock and then cracked my fist with the back of his head and toe against the wall behind us. Stupid move. Gavin's ears picked up the sound. Oh shit, Dez, he heard. Move! We both leapt down five flights from our perch. On the way down, I instructed, You take the fat one. But they're both fat. Oh, well, then, wherever you land, brother. Dez shot me a wink. I'll take the cops. He was hungry for swine. Like two starving Valkyries, we swam through the air toward our prey. Dez landed on one of the weight-challenged cops as I subdued Gavin. I snatched his head and ripped off his sweater. You don't even deserve this, motherfucker. Your gang is lame, but you're just a rat. I quickly began pounding his head against a discarded toilet in the alley, still shit-covered by vagrants who used it as a porta potty I looked over at Dez, who was having a good old time with his first pig. He ripped the asshole's hands off by snapping the bones, stretching them loose from the veins. Then, he shoved them down his pants, one in front and one in back. Always light on his feet, Dez shuffled steadily and swept the leg completely off the other cop who was trying to make a break for it. The cop tripped, face first. The sound of his nose breaking sideways as the rest of his face splattered like a bum's diarrhea on a curb made my eyes light up. I went back to work on Gavin Perry, the snitch. He was, after all, another vampire. I shoved his head into the bowl of the toilet. His ears crushed through the porcelain as they were cut loose by smashed shards from the seat. Furiously, I bounced him face first into the bottom of the basin. I don't want to seem overly romantic about my kills, but he wasn't going down easily. I had to use all of my strength. We had the element of surprise, which worked for us, even when dealing with a cokehead. I looked at Dez, who broke the arms backwards on his original puppet cop. Dez discarded him by throwing him to the ground and proceeded to the second cop, who was crying, with his face still buried in gravel. He tore the law enforcement issued pants off and yelled, Damn, RJ, what cop goes commando? He picked up the first cop by his neck while he took his boot and smashed the head of the other poor fuck on the ground. Oh, this is gonna be hilarious. When I went back to Gavin, I lifted his head out of the empty toilet. What's the big deal about to happen? He spat in my face. Fuck you, junkie. Really? I palmed his head with my right hand and beat it against the bottom of the toilet bowl again until my hand went completely through the front of his face. I opened my clenched hand, poked his eyeballs outward, and swiped out his brain. After extracting his mind, I grabbed his neck, thrust my other arm up to the elbow through the face cave, and disconnected his skull cap. I spun around like a college hippie playing ultimate frisbee and whizzed it toward Dez. Why get rid of it? It probably wouldn't have tasted good. Vampire body parts all tasted like Mexican water. They were generally more dirt parts than liquid. Only the real desperate sickos like the taste of human transfused to vamp blood. The real psychos, that is. Whew! I sat down for a second and looked at Dez's flesh sculpture. Come on, Dez. I figured my head games would surely overshadow anything Des had to offer up artistically. Do you think I'm a pussy for reading books now? He had taken the cops and put them on top of each other with their pants down. He might have even put the top cop's dick in the other cop's ass. Body parts from his showpiece covered the scene, 
but Des lined them up as if he were delivering some sort of Al Capone-like message. Get your friend to pull the stolen car around. We gotta get rid of... I made the limp-wristed gesture again. Gavin's body. Des snatched the hand out of the pitcher cop's pants and threw it at me. High five! I batted the hand away and picked up the duffel bag. It was heavier than I expected. Well, open it. Des licked his lips and skipped over next to me. I'm serious. He actually skipped. That was how excited he got for a fix. Slowly, I zipped back the top of the bag. Des's eyes ignited. Holy shit, Des. I looked over at him. There is like 50 pounds of Charlie in here. He dug his hand down to the bottom of the bag and felt around. Then, he pulled out a brick and slit the top open with his bullet fingernail, scooped out a little taste tester, and dabbed it on his lip. He used his tongue to roll it around on his gums. After that, he picked out another dollop and sucked it into both of his nostrils. Immediately, his face puckered up so that his top lip touched the point of his ratty nose. Fuck... He sneezed, catching a handful of his own bloody snot. His mouth opened up as he gasped for air, and he cranked his head around in a circle. RJ, this ain't Charlie, motherfucker. This is heroin, dude. What are you talking about? Why would Gavin Perry be getting a big duffel bag full of heroin? We run that shit. I don't know. Maybe these pigs made a mistake when they stole the evidence. I guess I don't care. We just scored enough H to last us months. Des, are you nuts? King Cobra is going to want this shit hand delivered to him, like tomorrow. Fuck him, RJ. We'll tell him that the cops didn't bring shit. Tell him there was some kind of mix-up. We cleaned up their mess and we should be paid for it. I looked at the bag and licked my gums with my mouth closed. That has to be the dumbest idea I've ever heard. Just then, the Desian stolen car pulled around so he could haul off Gavin's body and destroy the evidence of a vampire walking around and talking to cops. Des threw the duffel bag at me and tapped me on the shoulder. It's your call. Free heroin is free heroin. Cobra will never find out, dude. These are the only ones who saw us. The two pigs and the snitch. He pointed at the cops butt-fucking, then at Gavin, whose mangled face was somewhat supported by his toilet seat necklace. Des then pointed upward with his index finger. Someone up there might have seen the bag. He switched fingers and flipped off the sky. But, since there is no God, I guess he's got nothing to say. Chapter 3 prostitutes. Des dropped me off with Gavin's corpse. I dumped the body on top of the pimp and threw the duffel bag in the corner. This time, I didn't forget. I headed over to my room to see if the weird little girl was still there. Besides, the Desians would be over at any time to start the cleanup process, and they didn't interact a whole lot with humans. The last thing I wanted was some dumb, dead kid on my hands. I shook off the feeling of carnage and tapped on the door to my closet. Hello, little whore girl. You still here? She cautiously poked the closet door open with her huge prostitute shoes. Yeah, she replied. I opened the door a little more so I could see her hazel eyes and sun-freckled face. Do you want to come out and talk about all this? While the bad people are gone? I'm not going to kill you, I assured her. All of the bad people? Then what are you? She held up the handcuffs. They weren't on her wrists anymore. Well, fair enough. I guess I'm a bad person, too. I looked down at her platform shoes, expecting a nut shot at any minute. Please don't kick me in the sack. She kicked at the door and started to stand up. Do you want coffee or something? I asked. Is it going to have blood in it? 
Normally, yes. I think I can brew you up a cup that doesn't have any blood in it, though. I started walking toward the kitchen. I turned my head slightly to see her peering back toward the closet. A grin quickly came and went on my face as she picked up her tasseled silver purse and started following me. She sipped on the coffee that I told the Desian to make for her. She had showered and got most of the grossness off of her body. I was still somewhat bewildered that she was so calm. So explain this to me, RJ. Don't you think you're going to get caught killing people and selling drugs? I pointed across the room at the bottom feeder who was doing his job filtering and disposing of the pimps and Gavin's bodies. As far as getting busted for slaughtering a bunch of junkies, pimps, and lowlifes, not really. That's his job. She flicked at her puffy little cheeks. Well, how do you live in this house? I guess you could say I'm house-sitting. The truth was that I'd lived in a washed-up child actress's house. She ran into some hard times when her tweeny show, Dag Nabbit, got cancelled and she turned to heroin. To avoid being caught in the act by the lecherous paparazzi, who seemed set on driving her to suicide by dubbing her Drug Habit, a play on the title of the show, she bought a heroin den in Hancock Park. The only people who knew about the place were her accountant and me. I paid the bills and everything that came in the mail, so by chance it became my house. I figured she forgot about it and about me. I doubted that I would ever see that bitch again. It turns out she kind of fucked me over and made me an open target to all my enemies. The bottom feeder surveyed a nice prime cut and then threw it in a bucket. Hey... What's your face? Let the dogs in and feed them, I instructed him, as if he were a fraternity pledge. The maudlin teenager vampire did as he was told, but not without shuffling his feet across the floor like he was walking through a foot of maple syrup. That kid can't be any older than me. The tartness of the black coffee made her almost non-existent lip cringe. Do you have any sugar? Yeah. Don't try and go anywhere. If you think that I won't kill you, someone like him will. I pointed again to the bottom feeder that was mid-quest, progressing only ten feet across my living room. Let's just say he's anxious to make his first human kill. She opened her legs in the direction of the dork. I took the liberty of kicking them closed before he saw her. I walked into the kitchen backwards, continuing to watch her. He's actually only 13. His balls haven't dropped yet. Meaning? We haven't jumped him in yet. He's Dez's big progeny. I returned to the corner. The girl had slowly glided her way onto the couch. My Great Dane and French Mastiff came bounding into the house with the slug lord kid trailing them at a turtle's pace. First, the dogs came to me in the kitchen, sniffed around a little licked my hands and then proceeded to introduce themselves to my guest. What are their names? She scratched the top of the mastiff's head, causing a leg tantrum. The dog tried to give the girl his paw as the Dane leapt on the couch and started salivating all over her shoulder. The big one drooling on you is Leroy, and the littler one, trying desperately to have you shake his hand, is Skillet. Leroy stretched out his long legs and dropped himself into her lap, to which she gasped. She put both her hands on both the dog's heads and compared their sizes. She looked at me, avoiding eye contact. Why don't they attack you? Did you hypnotize them? Skillet somehow managed to sniff his way into the girl's crotch. Both dogs' tails were wagging frantically. The little whore was, after all their first real human interaction in a long time. Desians didn't count as humans either. For all intents and purposes, they were vampires as well. That's a misconception about, well, vampires. I figured they like us so much because they think we're hurt. You know, technically, we are dead. Lame, she said as Leroy leaned against her. Okay, so I guess you're in a gang. 
Can I ask you more about the other thing? First, tell me your name. Well, my real name is Balia, but that asshole you're cutting up over there called me... <sighs> Jailbait. Seeing as how I was the youngest trick he ever put to the street, she dumped half of the sugar shaker into her coffee. Ask away, bait, I said, smiling. Okay. She clung onto a crucifix around her neck as if she was in control. Does this scare you, monster? I snatched it in my hand. Yes. Religion scares me. Can this hurt me? No. She let out a defeated puff onto her hot coffee. Skillet, not alarmed by her sudden movements, gave up looking for attention and walked over by the door and sat down. Leroy had given up seconds before that and was fast asleep in Bates' lap. What about garlic? She scratched at her temple. Can it kill you? That depends. It can probably kill my chances of getting laid. Hmm... <laughs> She laughed and her tightened shoulders dropped a little. Her eyes widened a bit. How does it work? Can you be killed? Okay, rather than go through a million back and forth questions, I'll explain it to you in the simplest of terms. I grabbed the pimp's arm and took a sip. I can't live forever and even if I could, I would choose not to. Most of us are killed or last as long as the average human. I belched, and a little squirt of the junk blood shot back into my mouth. The blood was getting stale quickly. We are more powerful than regular people, but we can't fly or anything like that. On top of that, we have this insane healing ability. Huh? Uh, yeah. If I get stabbed or shot or something, my body rejuvenates and heals pretty quickly. Then, how do you die? I imagine that you probably have to pull our heads off to put us down. Can you turn into a bat, Batman? Leroy looked up at her and yawned. Then, without hesitation, put his monstrous noggin and mite-infested floppy ears back in her lap and moaned as if even he was sick of the conversation. I lit a cigarette to get the rancid taste of the arm out of my mouth. No. That's all bullshit, smartass. Being whatever it is we are, and there are hundreds of us, is more of a... blood disorder. I guess what makes us hypersensitive to light. If I went outside during the day, I wouldn't melt or turn to dust or anything like that, but I would be in a great deal of pain after about a minute. From what I read online, it's called photophobia. Beyond that, I don't know who my parents were. I don't know if I have some weird disease or not. I do know we can walk and talk and think, but I don't know why we're here. So, wouldn't that make you a zombie? I hadn't explained this to anyone besides a peewee in a long time. I shook my head. Not really. I can function. I do need nourishment, though. That's where the blood comes in. We can eat raw flesh, but blood from a beating heart is the best because the blood in our bodies always dries up. We need to replenish it to keep us walking. And what about the heroin? Well, bait, that's called addiction. I looked at her arms and couldn't tell if she was familiar with skag like most Hollywood hookers. As far as I knew, it was the easiest way to get a tween to turn tricks. Get them hooked. The thing is that you can't inject it into a bloodstream that doesn't have enough blood to support it. I tried it. It's kind of worthless and the buzz doesn't last. She tickled Leroy's ears. Hmm. We don't have fangs except for a couple of sats who have metal fangs made for them. So, we came up with the system to get high. It's really a variation on what several others have done over time to enjoy wine, ferment blood, snort speed. Whatever. You, uh, you want this? The bottom feeder interrupted, holding up a watch. Looks pretty nice. Skillet lifted his head off the floor and snarled a little. What is it? He looked at the faceplate. Say... Seiko? Keep it. 
I looked back at Bate. See, this is how we make money. We sell drugs, loot suckers, take their money and their drugs. Not a great life. She hid behind her hair. Kinda like being a hooker? Against my better judgment, I got closer. I wanted to brush her hair out of the way, but pulled back before making contact with her. Yeah. She sneezed on my hand that dangled a few feet away from her face. You seem pretty smart. Did you go to college? I wiped my hand on the back of my jeans and moved away. I didn't know if she sneezed at me to single that she didn't like to be touched, but I didn't want to touch her anyway. The hair thing was just annoying me. What part of not being out during the day didn't you understand? Our choices are pretty much night school. University of Phoenix or learn from the street. The resources are much limited to nothing. The only thing that we know is how to be hustlers. And what some of us learn from reading. But that's why we sell drugs and steal. Bates sipped her coffee. She looked happy with the sugary sweetness that warmed her tongue. So, how many of these vampire gangs are there? In Hollywood? All the sets are divided into different neighborhoods. I'd say there are around ten or so. It's a lot like the gangs in South Central, and the streets are clearly defined. We are the knucklers. Our area, and the heroin area, runs from La Brea to Fairfax and from Sunset to Wilshire. There are some smaller sets mixed in the area, but they don't interfere with our business. The Batwangers are in our area. Trying to be inconspicuous, she wiped her nose with her hand and then brushed it into Leroy's back hair. The Batwangers? Wait, did you just wipe a fucking booger on my dog? I pushed a box of tissues on the table in front of her. She ignored the Kleenex. Whatever, I have a cold. I pulled a tissue out of the box and wiped off Leroy's back. Whatever. Leroy doesn't want your sniffles. What are the Batwangers? She asked. I crumpled the rag in my hand and discarded it over my shoulder. Batwangers. <laughs> yeah. Chicks with dicks. A tree in tits. Holy shit. She spat her coffee across the room. I see them every night at Carl's Jr. on the corner of La Brea and Santa Monica. Well, they don't give us any trouble. I guess we've always figured that if anyone is that desperate to fuck a bitch with a bad weave and shoulders like a linebacker, they should just have it. How... how do they... They aren't snobs about drugs. They'll do anything. Most important, they suck cock, and then when the John starts shooting his wad, they bat out their dicks and essentially eat them alive. I sucked my cigarette down to the filter and put it out on the coffee table. Ugh. Yeah, it's... pretty nasty. All of the gangs are pretty peaceful with each other and all the action is delegated to a stoner gang of Rastas called the Battle Snakes. Seriously? The Battle Snakes. That's the best name they could come up with. That has to be the lamest name I've ever heard. Battle snakes? Like rattlesnakes? You're kidding me, right? I did say they were stoners. Not exactly known for their intelligence. They're some brutal badass fucks, though. I just stay out of their way. Truth be told about my relationship with the battle snakes, no matter how far I go to avoid them, they always manage to plow into me. So, what about all this blood after you kill someone? Do you just clean it up? I stood up and walked to the opposite corner of the room. The dogs both got up and followed me. Leroy shook the foundation of my house as he leapt from Bates' side. See this? I grabbed the bottom feeder by the shoulder. Little peewees like this kid come over and collect all the blood for us. At least, what they can salvage. I walked over to the fridge, opened it, pulled out a bottle... Both dogs sat in front of me in the kitchen expecting a tree. They smelled meat everywhere. Then we fermented to make beer and wine. It's pretty much shit. I took a swig off the bottle. But it helps take the edge off a night like tonight. 
Then, they take what's left of the bodies and bury them. You're a slob. I thought vampires were supposed to be all romantic and musical and stuff. I put the bottle back in the fridge. Fuck that. I've never worn a ruffled shirt. I've never played the harpsichord. She picked up a CD off the table and brushed away a rock of bass that Des was saving for later. Can you play music? I can play a couple chords and a guitar, but that's about it. She squinted and bit her lip. L. Byron Nightshade is a classically trained music guy. He writes songs for his girlfriends all the time. I heard his album at a record store. It was pretty dark. Oh, babe, that's all bullshit. Nightshade is some character from a bunch of crap books. It's no more real than... Batman? She said. I slammed the fridge shut. For your information, the tattoo is for the faction. They're a punk band. You sure are a mean little bitch, aren't you? I should be asking your story, but to tell you the truth, you're about a dime a dozen in L.A. Runaway. Turning ass for junk. Typical. Did you come to L.A. to become a big movie star? No, asshole. I came here to get away from being raped every night. As for the junkie hooker, I heard that young ass makes a lot of money. Jeez. At least I don't have a Batman tattoo. You got any other crappy ink? I subtly rubbed my ass. I didn't want to make it too obvious that I had something even worse. So, rather than make a dick of myself yet again, I avoided the question. Hey, what's your name? I said to the bottom feeder. Would you give these dogs something to eat? They're annoying the fuck out of me. I pointed to Skillet, who was sniffing and licking Leroy's ass. Not uncommon. The bottom feeder went into the meatpacking fridge at the other end of the kitchen and pulled out two steaks. The dogs strutted over to him and sat at his feet. Cook them up a little bit. I don't want my family getting worms. Yes, master, he said, almost belittling me. I rubbed the dog drool off my right hand and went back to the living room. How old are you, RJ? I'm not totally positive. I imagine around 30. Pretty cool. 30-year-old gangster vampire with a Batman tattoo. Enough, you little shit. I should have listened to Dez and jacked your ass up when I had the chance. I'm a fucking killer. I can kill you. The door unbolted and flew open from behind me. Yeah, RJ. You should have killed her. Dez walked in and stumbled over to bait, grabbing a lock of her greasy hair. You are such a pussy. You can't keep me locked up in this bathroom forever, Bates squealed. You shut the fuck up, whore, Dez yelled back. You'll be dead soon enough. He turned to me with his hand in an L shape and brushed his devil lock out of his dilated eyes. How stupid are you, RJ? If I remember correctly, Dez, you were about that age when I decided to jump you in, bitch. I let you off easy because you're such a little pussy. Remember? His head tilted to the side and he let out a disgusted sigh, almost as if he just farted. That's not the same. I'm like you. She's not. Bates' muffled voice interrupted. I can be like you though, right? I mean, you can bite my neck, right? You shut up before I kick this door down and bite your neck off. Be quiet, Bait. Let the big kids talk now, I said. Bait? RJ, what the fuck is Bait? Did you name it? What is wrong with you? Me, I'm Bait, she said from behind the bathroom door so you can bite my neck and make me a vampire, right? Shut up! Des and I both yelled at the door. There are no girl vampires. Listen, Des, I'm not about killing kids. Humans are cattle and all that, but I really can't bring myself to kill anyone who's 12. Maybe. I should have killed your ass before your balls dropped. Dude, you're being so stupid. What are we gonna do? Keep her around and bang her until she dies? Will that make me a vampire? 
In the Nightshade movies, Al Byron bit Amethyst Rose and turned her to save her from the elders. Bait? I shook the doorknob. Seriously, shut up. You can't make someone a vampire. That's another dumb myth. It's horseshit. Bummer, she whispered. You seriously can't think we're going to keep this little girl around. Do you know how much trouble we would get in? With the elders? Bates said. I pounded on the bathroom door. Christ, there are no elders. Be quiet for one second, please. Whatever, Batman. Jesus, RJ, you showed her your gay tattoo. He didn't show me the one on his ass. So, you didn't show her your ass. You didn't even screw her. It's a tattoo of the Tasmanian devil. <laughs> oh. oh, God, RJ, you sure can pick him. I rubbed my ass a little, but acted like I was picking a wedgie. Both of you. Fuck off. The bottom feeders walked over and handed Des a wallet. Duh, looks pretty filled, Des. Des snapped it out of his hands. Better all be there. You have your shit neat, now finish cleaning up and get out of here before the sun comes up. Des then spit in the kid's face. Thank you, the bottom feeder said. I heard Bate move close to the door. Is this some kind of club? She teased. Without even hesitating a second, Des kicked the door off the hinges, knocking Bate on her back. I'm gonna enjoy ripping your sarcastic little ass to pieces, whore. She was terrifying for the first time that night. Des lifted the door out of his way and bent down. What's it going to be? He drilled his heel into her stomach. Do you want me to just flat out pull your head off? No. That would be much too easy. I'll just take off a limb one at a time. Starting with... Your tongue. Leave her, Des, and a tongue isn't a limb. I lunged at him, knocking him against the broken door. I shoved his face into the bathroom mirror and smashed it into the sink a couple times. It didn't hurt him at all, but he got the message. <sighs> this is your fuck up, RJ. This is all you, asshole. I pointed down the hall to the front door. Vamanos. He pointed at Bate. Bitch, you'd better hope this faggot never leaves your side. I wouldn't give a drop of diarrhea for you. Then he stomped away. I threw her a towel to use as a tow rope to help her up off the bathroom linoleum. She stroked a chipped tooth. It was a small price to pay for Des plowing over her with the door. For some asinine reason, I felt partially responsible. As much as I would like to say that I taught Des a lesson, the fact was I didn't. He was constantly insubordinate to my leadership because he thought of us as bros. But the fact was, I was the leader of the Knucklers. It wasn't him. And it never would be. Until I died. He was nothing more than a little brother. And a kick around. Chapter 4 Children I looked at Des across the kitchen table. The duffel bag full of heroin sat in the middle. Okay, tool, what's your big super duper plan? Don't be a dick, he said as he dug into his teeth with a toothpick and then flung his hair out of his eyes. The way I see it, no matter what I come up with, it's better than that. He pointed to Bate, who was sitting on the couch, flipping through the channels for the remote. Leroy and Skillet sat on both sides of her, dead asleep. They were protecting her from Dez, nonetheless. I'm not going to tell you again. She's staying here for now until I can figure out what to do with her. Dez picked up a knife from the table and put it to his neck. How about... He dragged the knife across his throat. 
we kill the bitch. I stood up and knocked the knife out of his hand, scraping his ear. How about I kill you? Des threw up his arm, surrendering. (laughs) I'm just goofing around, brother. His shitty attitude was starting to get old. What's your awesome plan, Des? Jesus, RJ. Des picked up one of the dog's tennis balls and lobbed it across the room. Ouch! Bates squeaked as the ball pelted her in the jaw. I slapped him across the head. That was totally unnecessary. What? I was trying to throw it to the dogs. The dogs are sleeping and they hate you anyway, I reminded him. Des looked over at Bate. Hey, little whore thing. What? Bate said, annoyed as she massaged her jawbone. Des swiveled his fists over his eyes and in a baby voice added, Saw we... Bate tapped at the remote control, turning up the volume on the TV. Whatever, jerk, she said under her breath. I patted the duffel bag at the cloth handles. Get on with it, Des. Fine. Well, we both know no one saw us kill the BBP and those cops, right? I kicked my chair back and put my feet on the table. Yeah? Then, why don't we just take this and move it ourselves? Where do you want me to start, Des? First of all, Linwood Perry knows what we did. Secondly, he was sent to us from the Battlesnakes. Thirdly, how are we going to sell 50 pounds of H around here without anyone being suspicious about where the hell it came from? Des became animated like a TV pitch man delighting an audience of retirement home suckers. That's the beauty. They don't even know this heroin exists. They were expecting coke. So, they think we traded the coke for heroin. Either way, we'd be screwed. I'm sure Linwood and King Cobra are expecting us to deliver whatever we stole from the gathering back there in the alley. We lie. Where are we going to trade 50 pounds of heroin for coke and fly under the radar? The snakes control all the drugs. They'd know. Exactly my point, dildo. How are we going to sneak out that much extra junk onto the streets? We don't sell it on our streets. We sell this shit in Culver City. De Sangre territory. Are you fucking crazy? Who cares about those specs? Listen, I get all the bottom feeders to go down there and sell like low-life peddlers. They know the territory. All they have to do is stay away from the areas with El Renato de Sangre tags. We let them sell the dope like they are just nobodies and bring the money back to us. It's not like we're sending them out with pounds. We give each of them a couple of 20 bags a day. I thought about it for a second. I never tell them straight up, but it was a great idea. I stroke my fingers down my chin. Hmm. I don't know, Des. If we miscalculate even a little bit, we'll be dead as shit. You know as well as I do that if we even fuck up slightly, King Cobra is going to have our nuts. (sighs) I'm going to do all the legwork, pussy. Start acting like a leader and not... He pointed to Bate, who was petting Leroy and Skillet. A babysitter. Watch what you say, Des. I'm dead serious. There is a line not even you can cross, and you're getting really fucking close to it. It's just, it's just what? You're a nobody in the knucklers, bro. You're a nobody on the streets. If you disappeared, nobody would care. At all. The battle snakes have it out for us. According to Copperhead... I bounced back into the conversation. Okay, that right there. When did you and Copperhead become boyfriends? Even mentioning his name during a conversation about stealing drugs from his gang shows your complete lack of understanding. They hate us. We're lucky to be alive. You're not alive, Bate interjected from across the room. I kept my eyes deadlocked on Dez's. 
Shut up, Pete. I grunted from the side of my mouth. Come on, RJ, let me do this. I mean, you're going to get most of the money anyway, and you won't be doing any work at all. I grabbed the duffel bag and excused myself from the table. Get your hair cut. Des sprung up from his chair. So, it's on? Call a meeting at the garage. I'm in, but I have to know that everyone else is cool with this. Just as Ez was about to show me some love, the remote control wrapped him in the face. Fuck no, he yelled as he started toward Bait. You're dead, whore. Bait backpedaled on the couch. Leroy and Skillet jumped in front of her, grimacing like they were rabid. They emitted warning snaps at Des, broadening their parameter around Bait by moving their dense frames sideways, walling her in. Des stepped back to the table, seizing his black army battalion jacket off the back of his chair. So, this is how it's gonna be, huh? He walked over my imaginary line that I told him not to ever cross and simply said, Thanks, brother. I stood my ground over him. Make the call if you want this to happen. Don't say a word to Copperhead. I'll sell your ass down with him and not even bat an eye. Don't even think about fucking with me, Des. I will ship your ass back to Skid Row COD with all your pussy followers. Without saying another word, he moved past me, bumping my shoulder, staring bait down the whole time. Bait scrunched up in the corner of the couch and mimicked his fake crying. Sorry, she mocked. The door slammed behind him. Why? I asked her. What better stuff do I have to do with my life? Bates said. Why not go home to your family? You have that choice? Doesn't I don't? We have no families. Well, then how did you get here? How did you get on the streets? I scratched at my temple. Mm, not sure exactly. Anyway, this is a free ride for me. I don't like living on the streets either. I've already told you that we can't make vampires. Look, bait, you've been here for a week now, and although you lock yourself in the bathroom with your shower mat while Des and I do our vampy stuff, yeah, vampy stuff. I'm never in the way. I sleep on the bathroom floor. Shower mat. I corrected her. Shower mat, she agreed. Do you really want me to go back out there and find another pimp? Maybe I can go hang out with those assholes at Hollywood High. I want to see what you do. It's not real pretty. We're way more dangerous than any pimp you could ever find. She frowned and tugged on my arm. Think of it this way. I can lead pimps and Johns and frat boys back here for you to kill. Thought about it for a second. It's dangerous. And kind of evil. The last thing I want to do is subject a 12-year-old to whore, she inserted. That's not what I was going to say. I can be one of those peewee guys. I can, like, get my hair cut all in my face and act all mysterious. She rambled on, jumping from one situation to another. I don't like being in the bathroom. It sounds like you guys have a good time out here. I mean, I like heroin too. I scratched my head. Bait, listen to me. You can't become a vampire. I assure you that it isn't a fun life, if you can even call it that. Then I'll be a gangster. Or can I be like a churro? <sighs> First of all, it's chola. Secondly, no one in the knucklers is Hispanic. I was close to throwing my arms up in frustration. How could someone who has been on the street for a year be so clueless? Chola, churro, what's the diff? The diff is that those kind of gangsters are different from us. When they jump someone into one of their gangs, they just beat the shit out of them or make them shoot someone. We maim people. 
You saw what was left of your pimp, and you saw one of our peewees clean that shit up. She yanked my shirt off my shoulder. I can clean the house. I battered her hand away and straightened my shirt. What are you, the hooker Cinderella? The answer is no. Go grab your overnight bag and go back to your life. You fucking thought wrong. Go back to school. Go home. She started to well up, hid her freckly face behind her hair and pouted. Jesus, don't do that. Why would you cry? Did you ever think your parents might be concerned about you? You've been on the run for a long time now. They don't give a fuck at all, RJ. They don't care about me at all. My parents hate me. I want to live here and do what you do. God damn it, bait. She looked up from her skunky hair and blinked her eyes. Has that shit ever worked? I asked her. If you wanted a doll or a toy, maybe. It did work when I asked my pimp if I could get a pair of higher-heeled shoes. It didn't work when I asked my mom to get my stepfather off me. She smiled a little bit. I wanted to return the laugh, but the fact was it just wasn't funny. This isn't a joke. She reached over to me and gave me a quick hug. Thanks, RJ. The room felt like it shrunk as I became limp. I looked over her shoulder for an escape. Human touch. Ugh. From a table behind her, she grabbed her shot glass. I made you this. I took it from her. What's this? It's some of my blood. Why? Come on, vampire man, will you just drink it? I didn't want to know where she drew the blood from. I guess she was just a cutter or something. What a weird little kid. Okay. I lifted the shot glass, cheered her, and slammed it down. She squealed and ran into her bathroom. Just as quickly as her horseshoes had reached the bathroom, I heard them clogging back. She poked her rosy red face around the corner. One more thing. Can I sleep on your floor? No. Cool. I want to beat the gang. Need to get ready. She fluffed up her hair. Can you give me some money to go shopping on Melrose? No. She hopped back and forth on her feet. Why? What's wrong with you? You want to know what's wrong with me? Fine. My stepfather used to make me finger myself in front of him while he jerked off. When he was about to blow his load, he'd press my head up against the corner of the room, drill it into the wall, and open up my asshole so he could come inside me. He used to pin my younger sister down and make her look his balls while he shoved his hand inside her. He called her Pinball and came in her face. You're a vampire, so why would you care? The room became silent. For the second time, I looked at the door for an escape. But, rather than deal with anything, I pulled a bunch of blood-stained wadded bills from my jeans. Take it, go to Melrose, go wherever you want. She nabbed the money out of my hand and turned off the tantrum like it never occurred. Thanks. Chapter 5 Colleagues Bait and I turned the corner to the front of the Knuckler's garage. I spun a sign on the corner wall that had once said something about smog certification before the garage went up in flames. Home, I said to myself. Bait pulled something out of the front pocket of her sock and started fiddling with a touchscreen. Wait, I didn't give you enough money for an iPod. I said as soon as I realized what she was playing with. Where did you get this? Bait rolled her eyes up to me and crinkled her lip, playing tough. Stole it? I grabbed Bait's wrist, yanked the earbud out of her ear, and looked her sternly in the eyes. This isn't going to be easy at all, you know. Whatever, she spat back. 
grabbing the earbud cord from my hand and plugging it back into her head. We were late to the meeting. Much to my dismay, Bates spent too much time picking out a hardcore introduction outfit consisted of a black corset, spiked heels, a pair of skull-printed tights, a pleather miniskirt, and a scarf knee-high sock ensemble that matched the aforementioned tights. It was ridiculous. So, we were late to the meeting that I called. As we walked in, everyone grew silent as if my entrance comically scratched a record. A wrench dropped somewhere in the middle of the gang. Not only was every knuckler already there, but our tardiness gave Dez the opportunity to tell everyone in the gang about RJ and his dumb human prostitute. The smell of musty towels, fried wood, and bondo putty rose up from the floor and through my nose inside the dilapidated building where the knucklers met. It used to be Al's body shop till it burned down. The Friars Club it wasn't. See? Told you. Des pointed at bait. She slid behind my arm. No outfit could have made her look hardcore in the eyes of those asshole derelicts. What's up his ass? She said, tugging on the back of my belt. I ground my teeth. Shut up, bait. I warned you about the hearing. She shot me a thumbs up. Everyone, I asked you here to talk about something that could put us all in a shitload of danger. I said, Krang! A socket wrench beat against the blackened brick of the building, causing a snowstorm of torched building innards to fill the air. Des lowered the wrench, hacked up and spit a huge phlegm ball onto the floor. Aren't any of you going to say anything about him bringing a human to this meeting? His eyes scanned the room for support. Knucklers gathered in a circle, scratched at their necks and flinched around trying to avoid making eye contact with him. It was nice to see Dez's ill-planned coup d'etat going nowhere. The kid didn't have an ounce of leadership in him. I knew that nothing made him happier than the dream to overthrow my rule and then rape and suck down all of Bates' blood. Yeah, a badass bunch of vampires that team up on a 12-year-old junkie girl. Hmm. Feeling good that the mutiny lasted less than a minute, I decided to push him back into the corner where he belonged. I looked at my wrist to the watch I didn't have. Oh, are you here for the Girl Scout meeting? Little girl? I cracked with a sarcastic jeer. That was at six. The garage instantly erupted. Fuck you, RJ. Des shot back. I called this meeting for you, jerk. I'm here to tell everyone about your stupid plan, and then, if we unanimously agree, we'll do it. They all looked over to Des. This has nothing to do with the little girl, Des. This is about you, and I'm giving you the chance. So, speak. He cleared his throat. It was the first time that he ever had the chance to really propose anything important to the Knucklers. The other night, RJ and I took down some Perry snitch who was getting drugs from the cops. Turns out they were moving about 40 pounds of H. I want to put it back on the streets and sell it. Does Cobra know about it? Someone asked. We're not sure, Des continued. We were supposed to intercept a bunch of coke. I figure we just tell the snakes that there were no drugs there. Maybe you say that the snitch was double-crossed by the cops or something. The gang whispered amongst themselves. I called across the garage. Pico, beer. Pico dragged his leg over to the cooler. He had been out already that night hunting. His stalking gimmick was brilliant. He'd snap his leg backward and act like he was a vagrant. He constantly spent his time reading medical journals so he knew exactly where to break himself so that it wouldn't cause any lasting damage. I guess you could say the old man was our doctor. At night, he'd collect change and then devour what he considered the best suckies, drag them down an alley and have at them. He looked older and grumpier than the rest of us. His sharpe wrinkled face was filled with gray whiskers. He stood crippled in his mid-fives, and his body was made more awkward by his enormous forearms. The old bastard looked like Popeye's dad after a violent tour in Vietnam. Pico handed me a beer that he bottled himself. So, are you going to introduce us, RJ? 
He bit at his cracked lips and shot me a wink. I snapped the beer from his hand. Pico, you dirtbag, she's twelve. Twelve-year-old whore junkie, Des interrupted, drifting away from the conversation about the heroin. What the fuck is your problem, Des? Big Tahoe walked over and put his elbow on Dez's head to rest. He's jealous because he thought he was your only bitch, the mammoth balked. Dez shook him off and whipped a machete out that was tucked into the back of his belt. Always with the weapons. Whose bitch do you want to be, ho? This is just another one of our fearless leader shit ideas, just like the habit. We all know how that turned out. Dez, I said, calm down and tell everyone the rest of your plan. Then, we'll decide. He looked at Bate and then started again. We sell the heroin in Culver City. My boys will move little bits of the product every night. Sounds fucking dumb, another knuckler yelled from the corner of the garage. It's not dumb, Des insisted. It's called free money. This heroin is free. Most of the knucklers cleared out, except for those of us who made the decision. It turns out that many of the members were more concerned about bait being around the Dez's heroin plan. You know that you have to talk to King Cobra, RJ, Tahoe reminded me as he deadlifted the front of an abandoned Nova. I looked over at Bait, who was being babysat by Pico. Can we just not tell them about her? She seemed entertained. He was snapping his limbs back and forth and flailing around like a human puppet. It was pretty gross. Dude, are you nuts? Des took a shot of whiskey and blood. No matter what, this whole thing you have cooking up is a horrible idea, and if you don't tell them, they're going to find out. That's just what we need. The Battlesnake's calling for an all-out turf war against us. I hate to tell you this, RJ. Our land claim gets smaller and smaller every day. Des brushed his hair out of his face with his machete. Turf war? Seriously. Turf war? What are you talking about, Des? If there's going to be an issue between us and the snakes, it's going to be because we decided to sell their heroin under their noses. Tahoe broke in. As stupid as it sounds, you should tell Cobra about the girl. Might make him forget about the drugs. Look, RJ, Des said. I don't think I need to remind you how pissed off Cobra was when things went wrong with the habit. Shit, I wanted to fuck her too. It didn't go well. She exposed us all to the cloth. Cloth, I scoffed. Do you really still believe that fairy tale? Do you really believe that there is a group of renegade Catholic priests whose only mission is to create a vampire holocaust? Are you kidding me? No one has ever seen these guys. It's bullshit created by the snakes to scare you. Stupid. I don't know. A lot of gang members from every set have gone missing, Tahoe declared, dropping the Nova to the garage floor. Copperhead told me- Copperhead! Great. Your little alliance with these assholes just confirms everything I've said. The habit was never working for some mercenary god group bent on vampire genocide. She was just some washed up loser who wanted to see what it was like to kill people and it just happens to turn out that she was a junkie. I got a free house out of the deal. You guys really need to start thinking about what you're saying. We aren't in some big good versus evil battle with anyone. You know what our battle is, Des? We battle to get high. So. Some gang of Rastas thinks they're running something that's bigger than it is. It isn't. I blew smoke in his face. The cloth? Are you kidding me? Hey, RJ, check this out. Bate yelled across the garage. The few knucklers left had gathered to watch her. I couldn't tell if they were sizing her up because they wanted to drain her or if they were sincerely entertained by her childish antics. She cracked one of Pigo's legs out. Broken, she said. She cracked it back in. Fixed. I looked back at Dez and Tahoe, who seemed completely miffed by her display, and shrugged my shoulders. RJ, Dez said, turning away from the romper room. You've completely lost your mind. Not us. Listen to me. I know you took my ass in when I was living in the streets, 
trying to shoot heroin, sucking rat blood. Well, you're just that lucky, aren't you, Des? I took you in because you were pathetic. I took you under my wing because you seemed like a good enough kid. Are you jealous that I'm doing the same thing for her? You are such the fucking bastard kid here, and you know it. You should be glad that we accepted you then, and that we accept you now. Do you think your buddy Copperhead would think highly of you if he got a look at you on the skids, picking through people's feces, hoping to find some blood? I grabbed him by his shirt. Don't be a little bitch. Call your friend and set up some FaceTime between me and Cobra, if that makes you happy. Just remember, little man, you aren't all that different from her. Des flipped his hair over his head. What about the drugs? I say we do it, Tahoe answered. I pushed Des back into his chair. His eyes glossed over with stone as he nodded that he'd get it done. I stared at him. I didn't want to hurt his feelings, since I knew his pussy emo ass actually had feelings. But he had to know that pissing on my leadership and trying to make a joke out of me wasn't his right. This is hilarious, Tahoe chuckled. I patted Des on the shoulder, trying to mend the rift growing between us, then turned back to Tahoe. What's hilarious? He pointed back to the bait show. Hey, RJ, RJ, RJ! She was spazzing out like she had just found the greatest toy in the world. Look at it. Broken. Fixed. Broken. Fixed. The knucklers continued to observe her like she was a new pet. That's when I agreed to tell Cobra that Bait was staying with me, and we all agreed that we should sell the heroin. The next day, back at the RJ Estates, Des and I divided out small bags of junk to his followers. One by one, they lined up, all looking like Des, desperate, hair in their eyes, mopey with their backpacks open. I locked Bait in my room with her new iPod, stolen computer, and her pimp's discover card. Oh yes, Big Daddy Badass had a discover card. As Des distributed the little Ziploc bags of Mexican mud-like rations, I looked through a Thomas guy that I had spent the previous night dividing into sections, clearly defining the lines of rival gangs. I had all the pages of Culver City earmarked, and I flipped back and forth trying to figure out a somewhat centralized yet widely distributed area that only fringed on the Sangre territory. Personally, I didn't care whether or not Des's followers got torched, Unfortunately, they had such a clearly distinct and similar look that all paths would surely lead back to the Knucklers. Is there any way we can shave these kids' heads and give them, like, Slayer shirts or something? I asked. You know, get them out of those tight pants. Make them more... More what? Des asked. You know, I said... More... Mexican. I grabbed a kid by his choker and dragged him in front of Des. Throw a black carcass shirt on this kid or something. I shoved him to the floor. Des's lowly secretary whispered into his ear, hiding behind his bangs that almost touched his shoulders in the front. I snapped the kid over to me. No whispering, dork, I said. I need to know everything about this. There is more on the line here than you seem to understand. I started pointing around the room. Your well-being. Your well-being. I finished on Des. And even yours. The kid cleared his throat. I, 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 I was just telling Des that it was a good idea to move into Culver City unrecognized. But, um... Rather than shaving our heads, I th thought maybe we can tuck our hair into caps... Are you done? I asked, turning back to Des. Come on, Des. This isn't about being fashionable and looking hip. Mexicali vamp teens that skate and listen to Slayer will destroy these... I pointed at his followers again. Losers. For some reason, when they heard losers, their faces lifted from the profoundly depressed to the slightly sad. Even though their eyes showed hope, 
They seemed destined to be forever on suicide watch. Besides, I didn't intend calling them losers as a compliment. We don't want them to look exactly like Sangre, Des rationalized. If any of them do get busted, we all get busted for trying to take over their area. He questioned his drones. There isn't going to be any fuck-ups with this. Right? Surprisingly, Des's reasoning was well-founded. After all, I draw any attention to ourselves. Hmm. The hats will be good enough, I concluded. But try and blend in a bit more. One of the Desians raised his hand. W what do you mean, blend? Jesus, poser, you know what I mean, I said. Wear baseball caps on the side or whatever. Don't wear eye makeup or bowlers. Just try not to look like you think you're in a gothic fairy tale. The Desian smirked to his friend on his right. The friend added, But that is the norm now. Damn. Was I really the old fart in the room? Before I slung myself on the kid, I looked to Des for reassurance that they were the norm. Des nodded his head yes. To my surprise, these shits were more dime a dozen than the jocks, skaters, and dorks I watched on network TV. You'd be surprised, sir, the boy said. The kids my age dress like vampires. And what does a vampire dress like? I asked. He pointed to the back of the line at the only somewhat unique individual in the bunch. He was the kid I'd heard them calling Piglet. He was fatter than the rest of them, and instead of the covered eyes look, he apparently opted for the disgusting stringy black hair look. Topped off with a German iron cross brooch thing, his satin button-up shirt looked like it was going to pop because it was packed like a sausage casing with his chins and his neck. At the bottom of his look was a pair of not-so-tight black latex pants. He looked like the shorter and plumper bastard son of the L. Byron actor I pointed out to Des in the billboard for the Nightshade movies. That's real nice, guys, I said. If this kid is so lame, then why do you roll with him? I looked to Des. He shrugged his shoulders, setting off a chain reaction of more shrugging, puzzled looks, and raised eyebrows from his pupils. The secretary kid, who up until his next sentence I figured had leadership skills, finally blurted out, He knows where to... <clears throat> he cleared his throat. He knows where to get the coolest close. Are you kidding me? A voice said from the hall behind me. This is what you call a gang, RJ? All the Desians panted like starving wolves as I spun around. I thought for a second before speaking because I was pretty ashamed by the clothing statement as well. After a long pause, get back in the room, bait, finally came out. Told you, Des said to his clan. I pivoted back to him and got in his grill. Told them what, Des? I told them you let this little whore run the house, he mimicked Bates' voice. Here's your shot of blood, RJ. Here's your dog food, RJ. Leroy and Skillet came out of my room into the hall and joined Bates as her guardians. Daz grabbed his nuts. Here's your balls, RJ. Inconspicuously, the drones elbowed each other. Why are you nerds laughing? You're the ones talking about what's cool to wear. You're acting a lot more like a bunch of little girls than me. Bate flung her stare back to Des. I hate to tell you, but that is way lamer than me bringing back dudes for you guys to eat and get high on. Des looked at his watch. How long has it been now, whore girl? You haven't brought a shit yet except for a pain in my ass. Would all of you shut up? I yelled. When did this house become a junior fucking high school? Silence filled our living room. Bate grabbed onto her stomach as a wet burp came up in her mouth. She immediately made a beeline to the bathroom, slamming the door behind her. I heard her turn on the bathwater, but it didn't cover up the thundering sound of her retching. From what I made out, she managed to hit all four walls, including the shower curtain, the floor, and the sink. 
In seconds, some semi-chunky yellow fluid ran out from under the door. Thankfully, Leroy and Skillet were standing guard so they could lick it up as it exited the bathroom. What was all that about? I asked Bate. Her hair was a Medusa mess on top of her head. I thought about gently patting the mess out, but I didn't do anything. I didn't want to take the chance of getting her kid mange on my hands. Her swollen eyes looked up at me and she tried to speak through her bloated cheeks and glands. It's the smell of this place. I told you several times that our lifestyle is gross. It's not going to smell like a room at the Ritz. I know, I just think that when Des and his friends teamed up on me, well, it just reminded me of when I went to school. I don't understand. She sipped her coffee. It added to the hideous nature of her breath and I was trying to avoid direct contact with by turning my nose sideways. Well, before I ran away, I had just started junior high. My mind began to wander. I never went to school. I never cared about it and it seemed so far from my world and my reality. However, I said, go on. In my elementary school, I was like popular and had all sorts of friends and stuff. Yeah, I continued to listen but my interest faded as quickly as I heard the word popular. The word and its connotations were all foreign. Her entire story became completely inconsequential to me. I wasn't very popular when I was 12. All I remembered was being in an alley dumpster, only living to score heroin and find rats. I'm sure my smell alone was taken into consideration when my eligibility for popularity came into question. Anyway, over the summer before I went to this new junior high school, I told my best friend Brianna about what Thomas was doing to me and my sister. Thomas. Thomas the train... Thomas the stepdad. I salvaged the conversation. Oh, yeah, and your sister is pinball, right? Hey, you remembered. She smirked inside her inflated shell. She looked like a marshmallow dropped in a cat box that ended up sticking to all the discarded hair, turds, and litter inside. Huh, how could I forget a name like Pinball? I said. I love Pinball. Her smile dropped and she went cold. What is it now, Bait? She picked a barf biscuit out of her front teeth using the plastic lid of her coffee as a toothpick. She proceeded to wipe the discharge on the arm of the couch. Nothing. If you don't want to hear the story, then I don't care. It's lame anyways. I stood up, pretending to get something from across the room while she closed her eyes. Unnoticed, I grabbed a tissue and gathered up the asteroid that came out of her mouth. I shot a quick basket across the room. Swish... Come on, babe, I said. I fell back on the couch next to her. I like the game of pinball. I'm sure if I got the chance to meet your sister, I'd find her to be a very nice young lady as well. She chippered up a little bit. I could tell she was nervous about having the conversation with me as she gnawed at the styrofoam cup that she was drinking from. Okay, she agreed, spinning a half-moon-shaped piece of cup onto my coffee table. I ignored it. So, I told this girl, Brianna, who's telling the story here, she moaned and jumped to her feet, acting like she was going to stomp out and go back to her bathroom. Fuck, I'm trying to tell you something important. I caught her wrist. I'm sorry, babe. Sit back down, I want to hear the rest of the story. Where was I? She sat down and started again. Oh yeah, so I told this girl, Brianna, what Thomas, your stepfather, shut the fuck up, yes, my stepdad. I told her that my stepdad was having sex with me because she told me that she broke her hymen over the summer while she was riding her horse. I closed my mouth and made an uncomfortably surprised expression. I couldn't help but think about how absolutely inappropriate this conversation was. Rather than cut her off again, I simply sewed my lips shut bulged my eyes and started nodding my head. Brianna and I pinky swore these were our secrets and stuff. When she asked me if I liked how it felt, I might have said that I did because I think I was trying to show off about how mature I was compared to her or something. 
That night was a week before school started and my family went to Disneyland for vacation. Mm-hmm, I hummed. Well, I got back the night before school started and I was like all tan and stuff from vacation in California, she continued. The next day, I got to my first day of junior high school and everyone was ignoring me. Even Brianna? She nodded with a pout on her lips. The nerve. I managed to get out as I coaxed the discussion along. Right? That day at lunch, no one sat by me. I sat alone at a table near the back and this boy I liked came over to me and yelled. Hey everyone, Balia fucks her dad and she likes it. Slut. Then, everyone in the lunchroom led by Brianna started chanting it. Balia fucked her dad. Balia fucked her dad. She began clapping her hands as she remembered the chant. Balia fucked her dad. My face morphed from a sarcastic, uninterested jerk to the look of a concerned parent, and not her shit parents. My posture straightened. Shh, I said, comforting her. Hey, what did you do next? Did you run away to California right then? <laughs> no. This is where the story gets good. I didn't tell her that there was nothing inherently good about it. Actually, it probably ranked in the top three of the saddest stories I'd ever heard. So, I had gym class right after lunch and I didn't go to the class at all. Instead, I sat in the shower and cried. But I waited. I waited the entire period for them to get back from class. The second Brianna got to her locker, I jumped her and took out a sock with my gym lock inside of it. Then, I beat her halfway to death. She jumped up from the couch like she was a cheerleader, swung her arms around and kicked her bony legs in the air. Go bait! She cheered. B-A-I-T. What's that spell? Go bait! Leroy and Skillet howled and jumped up and down with her, causing Bate to stumble over Leroy and hit her chin on the coffee table. I tried to break her fall, but she nailed it anyway. Not leaving anyone short-changed, she hugged the dogs and they both licked her bulging face. Then, she finally sat down next to me, giving me a hug. Isn't that part awesome? Um, I guess... I tried to shuffle as close to the armrest as I could get, but she intensified her vice grip squeeze. Go figure. I was terrified of a 12-year-old psychopath. Hey, RJ. Yes, I answered. Can I sleep on your floor tonight? Yeah. Can I bring my shower mat in your room? Yeah. Can you wash it for me? Yeah. Yeah. Because you know my bathroom smells like barf really bad. Yeah, I know, babe. If you enjoyed tonight's story, please be sure to join us again next week for the continuation of Drew Stepek's Knuckle Supper. Knuckle Supper, Ultimate Gutter Fix Edition and its critically acclaimed sequel, Knuckleballed, are available now from Bloodbound Books. Also, please consider making a donation to Children of the Night today and help end teen prostitution and human trafficking. Children of the Night is a privately funded nonprofit organization established in 1979 with the specific purpose of providing intervention in the lives of children who are sexually exploited and vulnerable to or involved in prostitution and pornography. Visit childrenofthenight.org for more information today. From author Drew Stepik and all of us here at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, thanks for listening and for your support. For more than 20 years, Drew Stepik has written, produced, and directed for the publishing, online, and entertainment industries. Drew has worked for Film Threat, Sci-Fi Universe, Wild Cartoon Kingdom, The Tonight Show with Jay Leno, Late Night with Conan O'Brien, Saturday Night Live, The Profiler, The Pretender, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, 
and ESPN. In the past 10 years, the author ventured into creative directing and ideation roles involving entertainment and technology marketing for Davy Brown Entertainment and Straight Up Technologies. In 2012, Sebek took a position as the head of branded entertainment for Machinima. He has also been a creative director at Awesomeness TV and is currently the head of integrated marketing at All Deaf Media. Born in Royal Oak, Michigan, Stepek moved around a bit as a young man and finally found his home in Hollywood, California in 1994. Stepek attended Rollins College in Winter Park, Florida. His first novel, Godless, was released 666, June 6, 2006, and has since captured a strong underground following. Currently, Stepek is working on the sequels to Knuckle Supper and Knuckle Bald. You've been listening to Horror Hill, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted, and its featured stories performed by yours truly, Jason Hill. Additional performers have been featured when necessary to bring the tales to life. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respected authors. Sound design, original music, and final mixing and mastering provided by Luke Hodgkinson under the guidance of executive producer and director Craig Groshek. The program's artwork and logo by Jason Hill. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? I take submissions. Email it to me today at horrorhill at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of the show. If you enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure that you never miss an episode. And please, leave us a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and Horror Hill on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every Thursday. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button too to tell us how we're doing. Oh. And if you could, please leave a kind word, or even a request. If you can never get enough spooky stories and can't wait until next week for more, and haven't already, be sure to check out Chilling Tales for Dark Nights on YouTube for more than 500 free audio horror stories, including more performance from yours truly, and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, You'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, I'll be back next Thursday with more frightening fiction to haunt your dreams. Until next time, this is Jason Hill. Good evening. for